Hello, my name is Elise Dressel. I am the lead disease surveillance practitioner at Kane County Health Department. And today we will be covering measles, what to know. During this presentation, we will discuss the signs and symptoms of measles, possible complications, and modes of transmission. Additionally, we will discuss important time periods to remember, including incubation, infectious, quarantine, and isolation periods. We will also discuss what to do if you are exposed to measles, have symptoms of measles, or are confirmed to have measles. And lastly, before wrapping up, we will briefly discuss the steps that healthcare personnel must take if they have a patient who was exposed to measles or has measles. After this presentation, there are several things you should understand about measles and be able to describe. First are the signs and symptoms of measles. Second is how measles is spread in the community and possible complications that may occur in someone with measles. Third are important time periods for cases and close contacts, including incubation, infectious, quarantine, and isolation periods. Fourth is measles vaccine effectiveness and how to determine if an individual is immune to measles. Fifth is what to do if you or someone you know is exposed to measles, is showing symptoms of measles, or has a confirmed diagnosis of measles. And lastly, we will learn the importance of reporting by healthcare personnel and what the reporting process entails. For starters, let's discuss what measles is. In short, measles is a highly contagious disease. In fact, measles often infects 90% of non-immune exposed individuals. So if an infected person encounters 10 non-immune individuals, nine out of 10 of those individuals will become sick. In the United States, measles was declared an eliminated disease in 2000. This meant that there were no endemic cases in the country for at least a 12 month period. However, measles is still a common disease in other countries and outbreaks do still occur in the US. These outbreaks most often occur because of unvaccinated residents that bring measles back into the country after traveling abroad. Since measles elimination in 2000, there have been several measles outbreaks around the country. If a measles outbreak now or in the future does occur for more than a year, the country could lose elimination status. Now let's discuss groups who are at greater risk of measles infection and complications. When measles outbreaks occur, they most commonly occur among populations of unvaccinated or undervaccinated individuals. For example, among young children who have not yet been vaccinated, among adults who have only received one dose of the vaccine, or among a combination of children and adults who are under or unvaccinated. However, a small per percentage of vaccinated people can get sick if exposed to measles, which we will discuss more later during a slide titled, Why is Vaccination Important? Individuals at greater risk of severe measles symptoms and complications include infants and young children, pregnant individuals, individuals who are immunocompromised, such as people with HIV, cancer, or other immunosuppressing conditions, and undernourished individuals. Now let's briefly go over the timeline of symptoms one can expect to experience when infected with measles. Following exposure to the virus, the first symptoms of measles occur anywhere from seven to 21 days after the exposure date. Two to three days after the first symptoms begin, coplic spots appear. And one to two days after the coplic spots appear, or three to five days after the first symptoms, a rash often shows up. In the next three slides, we will go over what the first symptoms might include, what coplic spots are and how to identify them, and what the rash looks like and how it may evolve over the course of disease. As mentioned in the previous slide, the first symptoms can be expected to occur seven to 21 days after the exposure date. These symptoms may include a fever, which can reach above 104 degrees Fahrenheit, a cough, a runny nose, and red watery eyes. Coplic spots and or a rash follow just days after the onset of the first symptoms. So what are coplic spots? Coplic spots are small bluish white dots located in the mouth, particularly the inner lining of the cheeks. These spots occur in approximately 60 to 70% of measles cases and appear about two to three days after the very first symptoms begin. 
about three to five days after the first symptoms appear, a rash often develops. The rash starts off as flat, red spots located on the face and neck. However, over time, these spots can spread to other parts of the body. The spots may even combine into larger splotches, and some spots may become raised. Although complications do not occur in all measles cases, there are some groups that are at greater risk of complications. One out of 10 infected children will develop an ear infection, one out of 20 will develop pneumonia, and one out of 1,000 children will develop encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain caused by an infection. Importantly, pneumonia and encephalitis can lead to hospitalization or death, and death from these complications occur in about one to three out of 1,000 infected children. Among adults, diarrhea can occur in approximately 10% of cases or in one out of every 10 adults. Now let's discuss how measles is commonly transmitted or spread in the community. When an infected person coughs or sneezes, respiratory droplets containing the virus infect the surrounding air and land on surfaces. If non-immune individuals breathe the contaminated air or touch a contaminated surface and then touch their eyes, nose, or mouth, they can become infected with measles. Measles virus can live in the air for up to two hours after an infected person has left that space. So, an exposed person might enter a contaminated room long after the infected person has left, but they can still become sick if they are unvaccinated or otherwise not immune. Now we will talk about important time periods when discussing measles exposure and infection. First, let's discuss what an incubation period is. An incubation period is the time elapsed from the moment when a person is exposed until the moment they start developing symptoms. Please recall that when a person is exposed to measles, they will not develop the first symptoms until anywhere from seven to 21 days after the date they were exposed. So we consider the incubation period for measles to range from seven to 21 days with an average incubation period of 14 days or two weeks. The infectious period on the other hand is the period of time during which an infected person can spread disease to others. For someone with measles, they can infect others from four days before the start of the rash through at least four days after the start of the rash. Since the infectious period is based on the onset of the rash, we consider the day the rash starts to be called day zero. In total, the infectious period lasts for at least nine total days. The four days before the rash, day zero or the rash the day starts, and at least four days after the rash. Importantly, an infected person who is immunocompromised can spread measles during the entirety of their illness as it is possible they never develop a rash. Let's go over an example to better understand incubation and infectious periods. John is exposed to measles on March 22nd. John is unvaccinated and he is otherwise not presumed immune. Remember, the incubation period lasts from days 7 to 21 after the exposure date. So, from March 23rd to March 28th, John is not likely to develop symptoms. However, from March 29th through April 12th, which are days seven to 21, he can expect to develop the first symptoms of measles. In fact, on April 5th, he develops a fever and a cough, which is 14 days after the date he was exposed. And on April 8th, three days after John's first symptoms developed, he develops a rash, which we consider to be John's day zero. Since the measles infectious period starts four days before the onset of the rash and lasts for at least four days after the onset of the rash, we can determine that John could spread measles to other non-immune individuals from April 4th through April 12th. Over the next three slides, we will talk about what to do if you are exposed to measles, have symptoms, or know that you have measles. First, let's discuss what to do if you are exposed to measles. The very first step is to stay home and call King County Health Department. King County Health Department will assess your risk level and immunity status and provide additional instruction about next steps. Information on your vaccination status, age, and previous laboratory records is needed. If you need to be evaluated, your healthcare provider can make arrangements for you to visit the healthcare facility while keeping yourself and others safe. An immune individual is someone who is appropriately vaccinated, is born before January 1st, 1957, or has evidence of a previous measles infection or immunity to measles. If you are exposed to measles but presumed immune, you will need to self-monitor for symptoms for 21 days after the date of exposure. 
If you are not immune or do not have appropriate evidence of immunity, your healthcare provider may recommend you receive the measles, mumps, and rubella, also known as MMR vaccine, or in specific cases, immune globulin as post-exposure protection. If you do receive the MMR vaccine, you should avoid contact with high-risk individuals. If you receive immune globulin, quarantine for 28 days after exposure. Non-immune healthcare workers must quarantine from days 5 to 21 after exposure, even if they receive the MMR vaccine as post-exposure prophylaxis. If you are a non-healthcare worker, not immune, and do not receive the MMR vaccine or immune globulin, you must quarantine from days 7 to 21 after the date of exposure to avoid potentially spreading measles to others. During quarantine, you will want to stay away from public spaces, avoid contact with others, and monitor for symptoms of measles. Non-immune contacts will be actively monitored for symptoms by Kane County, in addition to school-aged children with only one dose despite their presumed immunity. As said previously, anyone else with presumed immunity can self-monitor for symptoms. Now let's say you were exposed to measles and start developing symptoms. This may include a fever, cough, runny nose, red or watery eyes, or even cough-like spots or a rash. Again, the very first thing you should do is stay home and call your healthcare provider or Kane County Health Department. This is very important as your healthcare provider can make arrangements for you to visit the healthcare facility while keeping yourself and others safe and may test you for measles during that time. Upon examining you and concluding there is a chance that you actually have measles, the healthcare provider will need to call the health department to report a potential measles case and discuss next steps. Kane County Health Department can provide you with additional instructions on next steps. If you have symptoms of measles, it is essential that you avoid public spaces and contact with others in addition to taking other precautionary measures, such as wash washing your hands and isolating for at least four days following the onset of the rash if one does appear. To determine when you can return to normal participation, such as going to work or school, spending time with others, or visiting public spaces, you should follow the guidance from Kane County Health Department. The health department can issue a letter stating your isolation has ended if your school or workplace needs one. If you have measles, the steps you should take are very similar to if you have symptoms. First, stay home and call your healthcare provider who may wish to further evaluate you, in which case they will make arrangements for you to visit the healthcare facility while keeping yourself and others safe. Or call Kane County Health Department who will provide you with instruction on next steps. They will also provide you with guidance on when you can return to normal participation. In addition, your provider and or the health department might also need to issue a letter stating that your isolation has ended if your workplace or school requires such a letter. If you are infected with measles, as we've discussed already, you must isolate for at least four days after the rash appears, which involves avoiding others in public spaces. While there is no treatment for measles, it's important to get lots of rest, drink a lot of fluids, and take over-the-counter medications for symptoms as needed. So far, we've mentioned a few times the measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR vaccine. However, we haven't gone over why the vaccine is so important. In the US, approximately one out of every five infected people with measles is hospitalized. However, the MMR vaccine is highly effective at preventing measles and decreasing severity of disease in infected vaccinated individuals. Having two doses of the MMR vaccine is 97% effective at preventing measles, meaning only three out of 100 individuals with two doses will become infected with measles. These individuals will have less severe symptoms and are less likely to spread measles to others compared to an infected person who is unvaccinated. A single dose is 93% effective, which means that seven out of 100 individuals with one dose will get sick. But again, this individual will have milder symptoms and be less likely to spread measles to others. In addition to the MMR vaccine, a MMRV vaccine is available for children who are one to 12 years old it's the same as the MMR vaccine with additional protection against varicella, also known as chickenpox. Whether an individual with one dose of the MMR vaccine is considered fully or partially vaccinated depends on their age and risk of transmission. It is recommended that the first dose of MMR vaccine is given between the ages of 12 and 15 months. This said, a two-year-old child with one dose is considered fully vaccinated. It is recommended that the second dose of MMR vaccine is given between the ages of four to six years old. The second dose should not be given any sooner than 28 days after the first dose 
and is required for school entry in Illinois. This said, a five-year-old with one dose is considered partially vaccinated, while a five-year-old with two doses is considered fully vaccinated. If an individual receives their first dose before 12 months, they should restart the series per the schedule. It is recommended that anyone born on or after January 1st, 1957, who is not already vaccinated with at least one dose, be vaccinated in order to catch up with Illinois recommendations. However, healthcare workers who are born before the state are recommended to have two doses of MMR. Important to know is that receiving additional doses of MMR is not harmful. So, if you are unsure of your vaccine status but wish to be vaccinated, there is no harm in receiving more than two doses. So far, we have discussed vaccination and its effectiveness at preventing measles. We have also discussed quarantine and isolation to prevent disease spread for someone who is exposed to measles or has measles. However, there are other precautionary measures that can be taken to limit the transmission of measles. These include covering your mouth when coughing or sneezing, washing your hands often with soap and warm water, avoiding the sharing of utensils, meals, or drinks with others, frequently cleaning spaces and surfaces using household disinfectants, and using personal protective equipment if you need to go into public spaces or be around others. We've gone over a lot of information related to the control and prevention of measles. Let's briefly summarize some of the key points. First, individuals exposed to measles are considered contacts, and individuals with suspected, probable, or confirmed measles are considered cases. The isolation of cases and quarantine of contacts is essential for preventing disease spread in addition to vaccination of non-immune contacts. And speaking of vaccination, the MMR vaccine or immune globulin are effective at preventing measles for an exposed contact who is not presumed immune. And lastly, as we just covered, there are several additional precautionary measures that assist in halting disease transmission in the community. Before wrapping up, let's discuss reporting for healthcare personnel. In Illinois, any suspect, probable, or confirmed case of measles must be reported within three hours to the local or state health department via telephone. Immediate reporting of measles is important for health departments to monitor cases and outbreaks, provide healthcare providers with guidance in handling exposed and infected persons, and inform and implement prevention and control measures in the community. This wraps up the end of this presentation, Measles, What to Know.